1,447 hectares. We are classified as an urban city with 31 villages. Our latest total population is 163,676, with an average growth population of 2.3%. My city also largely considered as the region's center of trade and commerce, banking, healthcare, education, telecommunication, and media. When I was elected mayor in 2013, I have already made solving our city solid waste challenge a priority. While we do a good job of collecting waste, our disposal site is an open dump which has grown persistently for the past 50 years. The open dam sits just meters away from one of our truly nice beaches, locally known as the Blue Beach. It is here when General MacArthur, U.S. Liberation Forces in the Pacific landed. In 2014, we generated 53 tons of waste daily. A World Bank study estimated our waste volume at 45 tons. And with our solid waste interventions like segregation, reusing, and recycling, this has gone down to 29%. Our estimated and collected municipal solid waste, however, remains at 16 tons every day. Because we have a small land area, my city has not been successful in managing waste because there is no longer available space for a landfill. We have a small economy of our resources is limited to meet our present needs. The job of maintaining the present landfill and keep it from spilling into the sea is therefore a great challenge. Because our resources are limited, we can only afford an effective collection of our waste. With less funds to buy equipments, keeping the waste from spilling into the sea has been very difficult. Not only is funding a problem, we also have long accepted we don't have the required technical and the financial resources. For 50 years, many leaders who came before me presented many solutions and attempted to manage our waste. However, no one came as close of being successful in solving this problem. Procter & Gamble Philippines came at our doorstep and proposed the Waste to Worth project. The timing was perfect, the goal was within reach, and a workable solution was at hand. After several visits, the Gupan was considered a strong candidate for the project. With no time to lose, the project proponent Sure Global Waste to Worth already made extensive waste characterization and designed the system. Waste to Worth augurs well for us because they provided what we sorely lack, the technical skills. It was in full compliance with our solid waste management laws. Hopes were bright that we are finally closing our open dump site and this could be realized without setting up a landfill. Waste to Worth is the most viable solution at hand and is now seen to directly and positively impact in our economy. We can tell the world we did not see this day that would come when our trash can be converted as a cheaper and alternative source of diesel, great fuel, and for our small marginal fishermen as well as the needs of our 3,000 strong fleets of public motorized vehicles. Waste to Work Project is a story of triumph of good and functional partnerships. Our responsibility is to bring hope to people who have long depended on our solid waste. Today, we have established a formal and decent housing for our waste pickers. Today, even the children of our waste pickers live better. We even set up a daycare center for them. Our responsibilities include giving them free medical care and insurance, including their families. Today, our responsibility is to bring them a good government that would finally free them from the chains of poverty by offering them 
better opportunities. Finally, our responsibility is to keep our ocean clean for our people. The future looks bright in our city as we take these bold, serious steps to end to our solid waste problem. With major investments coming in, we expect the opening of new avenues of growth and the, earth, and the entry of new enterprises and investments. With this growth, we anticipate a volume increase in our solid waste. And today, we know better that we need to take care of this problem now. This measure is largely seen to free our city from our half a century problem, when it can now be heaven for trees and clean air, and where our ocean can be free of waste for the future generations to enjoy. And if this succeed, we can show the rest of the world that no city, no matter how small, can be conquered by small, by a mountain of waste, no matter how big. And with your help and your encouragement, we shall succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Belen. What a wonderful story. And it is a wonderful story because a lot of the challenges we face come from the developing world, and this is a wonderful story of recovery. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me call to the stage David Stover, who is a co-founder and CEO of Bureo. Bureo is doing wonderful things in Chile, including these glasses that were not sent by Federal Express to me last evening by Bono, but that are produced by Bureo in Chile, 100% recycled fishing nets. David. Thank you. As Jose and Maria mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Boreo, and we're looking for innovative solutions to plastic pollution. So our journey started in 2012, when I would join two friends, Ben Kneppers and Kevin Ahern, on a search to find out why plastic pollution was accumulating in our oceans. As passionate surfers and outdoor enthusiasts, we left behind safe careers to follow our passion, which was the ocean. This was an image that we became tar far too familiar with, plastic on beaches. We started to ask questions. As Jenna said earlier, over 8 million tons of this plastic is estimated to be reaching our oceans every year. So early on, our team followed the work of Captain Charles Moore and the Five Gyres team to grasp the complexities of plastic in our ocean. Various composition levels, degrading at different, different ways, it was a must that we needed to focus on prevention. This led us to a mission, to create innovative solutions, to positively impact the environment, inspire future generations, and initiate social change. This mission would bring us to Chile. In Chile, we found an incredible audience that's been receptive to sustainable development. There's a diverse ecosystem, and there's an incredibly vast coastline. We also have been given an incredible opportunity through Corfo, sponsored by the Chilean government, to be a part of their Startup Chile program, in which young entrepreneurs are given the support they need to launch their ideas. Our idea was to look at plastic waste entering the ocean, find a stream of this waste, and to upcycle it into products, but not just any products, to find valuable products that would have long lives with end-of-life solutions, the first of which would be a skateboard. And the idea was that the proceeds from these products could go on to support the expansion of recycling programs. Now looking at the types of plastic entering our oceans, we needed to find a starting point. We saw viable alternatives for plastic bottles and thin film wrapping in the form of increased infrastructure for recycling, and better yet, other sustainable materials. This caused us to dig deeper, leading us to the issue of discarded fishing nets. Fishing nets are polymer-based materials used in fishing communities around the world. Fishermen are often repairing and replacing these nets with very limited infrastructure to waste disposal or end-of-life solutions. These, as a result, these materials can often make their way into the marine environment, causing negative impacts. This image here shows that this is not a problem just here in Chile. This picture was taken off the coast of California by the ghost fishing dive team. Clearly shows that this material can have negative impacts on the environment when it reaches there. We're working here in Chile because we've been given an incredible opportunity from the Chilean government and they've embraced our project. In response, we've established Net Positiva. It's a fish net, and collection, fish net collection program established along the coast of Chile, which we work with artisanal and commercial fishermen to recycle their fishing nets. 
In this respect, we walk into communities, we educate them on the material, we show them that there's value in this material, and we work with them to stockpile this material by or near the port. From there, we transport the material to Santiago, where we work with Comberplast, a qualified recycler and manufacturer, to injection mold this material, once recycled, into high-value products with end-of-life solutions. This is the first skateboard made from recycled fishing nets here in Chile. And we launched it just this past year with an incredible response. We've been honored to put it into the hands of some of the world's biggest ocean warriors and even a prince. This response has motivated us to keep innovating. We recently teamed up with Karun Eyewear, an innovative company here in Chile, to develop the first sunglasses, first sunglass frames made from 100% recycled fishnets, which Jose Maria is now modeling for us. As this, this solution, this, we were motivated to expand beyond skateboards because we wanted to enable wider audiences to be a part of our solution. This product shows you innovation right here in Chile, and it also shows you that our project can grow sustainably. So now we're focused on growth. Starting in Coquimbo with one collection point just over two years ago, we're now working in eight communities in Iquique, Concepcion, and Coquimbo. In addition, we've received additional support to the Chilean government through their scale program, and we've partnered with Patagonia through their 20 million in change fund, which is supporting like-minded startups having a positive impact on the environment. And I can tell you, these are not just one-touch projects. I've had an opportunity to spend a couple weeks over the last two months here with my co-founder, Ben Kneppers, and his wife, Gabby, to visit them in the town that they're living in, in Cochogue, to see that we're looking to build sustainable programs in these communities, that for every kilogram of material they collect, we're able to put funds back in to support waste infrastructure and community development, because we believe an incentive is key. So we've developed a tangible solution to which we've been working over the last few years to develop these net collection programs. But we know, as, as Jose Maria said, and as Under Secretary Novelli said, that we cannot solve these issues on our own. It is our responsibility to join you in this, join you in this effort to solve these problems together. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for what such a wonderful story. And what a, what a great success this country has put together in terms of Startup Chile, attracting 100 entrepreneurs from all over the world every year to come and live in Chile and come up with solutions like this one. So Marco, you have been doing some really entrepreneurial work on these issues yourself. Please share them with us. Thank you, hello everybody. Uh, I am from the Rest Water Foundation and uh, this, this year I was uh, uh, set up uh, an amazing project. It's called the Rest for Water Odyssey and I was sailing on all the oceans, more than 55,000 uh, kilometers at all. And uh, the, the, the main objective, the main goal of that uh, was to uh, go on the center of the five gyros and uh, uh, stopping on the islands and uh, trying to understand really what's happened with those plastics uh, so far away. And uh, it was just uh, ama amazing what I saw. And uh, we, we have plastics everywhere, everywhere. Uh, we spoke about uh, uh, Easter Island uh, this, uh, this morning. We went to Easter Island. Here in my hand, uh, I have a micro particle of plastics. And, uh, uh, we can find uh, an average of uh, four glasses like that by 50 centimeters square uh, on the beaches in uh, Easter Islands. Uh, we found uh, many, many, many plastics everywhere, uh, beaten by, uh, by fish, by, uh, by a turtle, by uh, uh, birds. As you can see, it's beaten everywhere. So the, the plastic problem is uh, just a terrible issue. And uh, I was on all, all the, those islands, and I saw with my eyes exactly what's happened. So the people there, they are facing every day. They are cleaning the beaches. And after that, what's happened? They don't know what to do with the waste. 
uh, mainly they have uh, what we can call a uh, landfill, and they are putting the, the, all the plastic waste on the landfills. On some islands, they are burning the, the landfill, the waste on the landfill. So you imagine the, oh, the problem uh, is big. Uh, some people are speaking about uh, uh, um, land of uh, plastics, about the seven continent or things like that. There is no seven continent. The plastic is uh, spread uh, in, the, in the ocean and uh, you cannot work on that. And uh, this is just uh, imagination. But the, the, so uh, trying to clean the oceans by uh, finding solutions on the, uh, on the oceans, I think I don't believe to that. Uh, to, to find solution, we have to work at the source, and the source is the land. So we have to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to try to find solution to decrease the plastic waste on the, on the land. Um, maybe, uh, where is my, sorry about that, I'm speaking, speaking, but I forgot the slides. So uh, what we believe in the foundation is uh, we, we, if we can get uh, values to the plastics, you will see that people will clean. So uh, the idea behind is how to get values to those uh, plastics, because plastic is done by petrol, so at the end, plastic is valued. So uh, you will see here a small movie about the solution that we, uh, we will uh, promote for next year. It ends up in a landfill at best, but more likely in the streets of our cities, and from there, in rivers, and finally, in our oceans. Some recycling plants proved to be efficient. Pet bottles as well as aluminum cans became a source of income for hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Therefore, recycling in this case plays a social role as well as an economic one for these informal collectors. But there are many types of plastics that await to be recycled. A recently implemented solution allows to recycle plastic into oil. Once collected, the plastics need to be sorted by time. From there, they are shredded into small plastic chips. These plastic chips supply the plastic oil machine with the necessary raw material. According to the set temperature, the machine will be able to produce different types of oil, from gasoline to kerosene to diesel. The waste to oil system gives an opportunity for remote islands communities to deal with their plastic trash in an efficient way. It also creates an income opportunity by giving value to an almost endless source of raw material, thus fulfilling a very important social role in some areas and leading to the cleaning of some of the most polluted spots. So all the, the, the picture, the, the, uh, the image that you saw in the movie, it's, uh, we took that during uh, our odyssey. And the machine that you saw, who is uh, transforming the, the plastic waste in oil, uh, we, uh, it's the government of Palau, it's in Coral, that they are using uh, that. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, we can work with, uh, I don't know exactly how to, to call that, but with poor people that uh, today they are, they are collecting the aluminiums, they are collecting a pet bottle because they can get money with that. And uh, if we can uh, uh, also uh, give them money to collect the plastic waste, uh, the, you will see that we can uh, really have a, a great impact by uh, decreasing the, the, the plastic waste uh, problem. So the, 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 the goal and the idea about the solution that we, uh, we are promoting uh, for next year is to pay people, to pay people to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, the plastic back using uh, those kind of machines that is transforming the plastic in oil. And uh, the, the oil has a value, as, as you know, it's about uh, 70 uh, centim uh, euro uh, for, uh, for uh, one uh, liter of oil. So uh, behind that, we can uh, have a, a real uh, solutions uh, that we can uh, face the, 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 this uh, big issue of the, the plastic waste. And uh, the impact of uh, the, the, uh, those kind of solutions, uh, the plastic waste will uh, decrease, and we have a different kind of, of machine. We can uh, treat uh, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 8 million uh, ton uh, of, uh, of plastics with uh, diff the different kind of machine. You give job uh, to uh, people who have uh, no employment. Uh, you have uh, uh, also a uh, great impact, a uh, social impact you have uh, because the quality of the life will be uh, better and uh, we can uh, transform that in, uh, in oil and uh, maybe other uh, solutions too. 
Okay, so thank you very much. I think my time is, uh, is done. Uh, and uh, uh, I, we are looking for partners, we are looking for uh, uh, brands and companies that uh, will help us to deploy these uh, kind of solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. So, Aldo, Belen, David, and Marco have been talking to us about how do we make good business out of uh, recycling and out of taking waste out of the ocean. Justin, you head up the uh, International Sustainability Unit. You have been looking at this challenge for a long time. Please sum this up for us. Monsignor, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, kindred spirits, um, I have long said about Jose Maria that he is, his charm, his intelligence, his political astuteness is only surpassed by his sartorial elegance. <laughs> I, rest my, I rest my case. He is, he's gone in his long and distinguished career from being a national asset to an international treasure, but please, please, I beg of you, be very careful if you light a cigarette beside him, because otherwise we will have an international calamity. <laughs> Too precious to waste. Um, and it's, it's very bad form, and being English, we don't do anything in public, let alone emotion, but I, would, I, I just wondered if I could ask you a few questions. Um, don't be embarrassed if you can't answer them. Are any of you from minister, ministries of finance here? Um, anybody from ministry of economy? One, good, good, excellent. Do we have anybody from institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies, banks, <laughs> investors? Anybody who's ever handled money? <laughs> Hooray, good, success, at last. Well, I need to say, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a slight problem because I think despite the heroic efforts, and thank goodness for Chile, and thank goodness for... Um, Secretary Kerry and Secretary Novelli, who's done so much to push this up the agenda. We are about 30 years behind. And the oceans and plastics and the industry which support them are so far from being at the top of anybody's agenda at the moment, other than the meeting last year and now it's starting to go up. Um, we are living not only in a world that badly needs a circular economy, but we are living in a world which is entirely integrated. And the type of issues that we're facing in terms of plastics are the same for renewable energy, the same for energy efficiency, same for clean water and food. And yet the issue of plastics and the issue we require to put together to make this a viable concern to have projects which are, heaven forbid, feasible, let alone bankable, perish the thought, are really quite considerable. I don't know if any of you have had the joy question mark, of being in some of the G20 meetings of the last few years. How many of you have been in the B20 meeting? I was in the very astonishing B20 meeting on infrastructure in Ankara a few weeks ago. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I raised the issue of the oceans and marine. Me, nobody else. I could have been talking a very strange language other than this Mumbalese English, which I'm terrorizing you with at the moment. But we have... $90 trillion are going to go into infrastructure in the next 20 years. $90 trillion. 65% of that is likely to be on coastal areas, coastal development. The impact, the point source impact of that in terms of pollution, plastics, waste, toxicity, morbidity, human health, epidemiology, let alone climate change, are absolutely massive. And one can only but salute the marvelous efforts that are going on around the world to develop these projects and these superb, innovative solutions. But they are not, they are simply not at a scale of what they need to be. We are facing a crisis. And at the moment, we're, you know, we're nibbling around trying to find a few good ideas and hoping they can go to scale eventually. We don't have time, ladies and gentlemen, for eventually. We need to find a way of working together public sector, the private sector, social groups, the NGOs, and please, the bankers and the finance ministers and the Minister of the Economy, to work out what are the enabling conditions to make this possible at scale now. Not at scale in 20 years' time, at scale now. It is not difficult. We have the solutions. Goodness gracious, we have the money. There's enough money floating around the world to help. It's just most of it's going to plastics in the ocean. So we do need a bit of a solution at the moment. A couple of 
other things, if I may, before I stop. If we're going to put something which is going to be sufficiently integrated, sufficiently coordinated, and sufficiently strategic, we need to know in general terms what is going on. We need to have an enabling framework. We need to have a development framework where we can actually understand what are the types of finance that are already available. What are the types of institutions who are working in this area? What is the private sector doing? What are the blocks? What are the challenges? What are the constraints? What is needed to address these things? And what are the catalysts? That doesn't exist. It does exist to some extent for the energy sector. It's starting to exist for infrastructure, although that may, I fear, go in the wrong direction unless we work very hard. It does not exist for the marine side. We have to find a way of linking marine issues and plastic and waste to infrastructure and to energy and to climate change. We cannot afford the luxury of talking to ourselves all the time. I do hope and pray that when uh, this conference reconvenes again in America, that many of the audience are from ministries of finance and ministries of economy. We need very badly to get a lot of money on the table. And the money you know, required is actually relatively small. It's a curious fact that if, um, if we were to take dear Enrique Salas two billion for 10% of the, uh, of the oceans, my mass is terrible, so I don't believe a word of this, but I think last year's military budget was $1.7 trillion. Well, the two billion that Enrique needs for 10% of the world's oceans to be protected is more or less what will have been spent today from the time you had a cup of coffee to have your first gin and tonic. <laughs> or perhaps your second. But it's not much, and the money is available, and we badly need to access it. There's an interesting German writer called Henrik Hein who said that experience is a very good school, but the fees are quite expensive. We have, I think, probably starting to learn the costs of our mistakes. We badly need to learn the value of our future, and I hope that together we can achieve that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. So well said, Justin. Thank you ever so much. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now call on some of you here on the floor for your commitments in this field where action is required. Uh, Senator Lagos Weber de la Región de Valparaíso. Por favor, señor. Thank you, President Figueres. Good evening, good afternoon to all of you. I'm a senator from Valparaíso, so this is my constituency, so you are most welcome here today, Your Highness and everyone. Um, I'm certainly thrilled by, by this meeting, by the commitment of the Chilean government and our president for the announcement that she made today morning concerning Easter Island and Juan Fernandez. Uh, for a developing country like Chile, it's a huge, huge uh, responsibility. The announcement is, quote, the easy part, to manage that, to make sure that we fulfill what you have to do is another one. Having said that, and listening to the panelists and the different experiences, one wonders what else can we do? And, and I have two specific commitments, very modest compared to what I have heard here to, today afternoon. And I will, if you allow me to switch into Spanish, because this is being transmitted, this is streaming, I have my constituency and my people, and I want to make sure that they understand exactly what is it that we are committing here to the uh, afternoon, to the afternoon. So, first of all, what I'd like to say is the following. There is the International Day of Oceans, June the 8th in the UN. In Chile, that day is not a national holiday. We have a presented a bill so that every June the 8th in Chile be celebrated as an official day. From that viewpoint, this means that public institutions, schools, public officers, civil servants will have it present in their annual agenda and know that there is a moment in time, June the 8th, with regard to which we can make commitments. The second commitment, also at a scale for the region of Valparaíso to form a foundation, our ocean in Chile, exclusively focused on training, educating our children, primary school children. Regarding what we're talking about here, we have specific 
proposals here for plastic and others. The question is, what can we do so that the future generations may take ownership of this and carry this out? These are the two commitments. And so we're hoping that at the 2016 conference in the USA, we are hoping to be able to say that this is how we've moved ahead. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, señor senador. Muchísimas gracias. Let me now call on Ms. Jane Nishida, who is a Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of International and Tribal Affairs at EPA, and on Mr. Chris Corbin from UNIPSIP, who will proceed with the next announcement. Thank you. Again, my name is Jane Nishida. I'm with the US EPA. I'm glad to be joined here by my partner, Chris Corbin, uh, who is not here to join in this partnership, is a representative from the Peace Corps, but we will speak on their behalf. I'm here to announce an exciting new initiative called the Trash-Free Waters Initiative for the wider Caribbean region. What we attempt to do in this initiative is to model after EPA's domestic program where we work with local communities, and in this case, we will have Peace Corps volunteers working in the Caribbean to launch an initiative to work with communities to reduce marine litter into the Caribbean Sea. And we are also too excited to announce that Jamaica and Panama have agreed to be the first two pilot countries in the Caribbean. Protecting our Caribbean Sea, safeguarding our future. That was the mission that UNEP's Regional Seas Program for the wider Caribbean developed a few years ago. And certainly it is with great pleasure that we welcome this partnership uh, with the EPA, with the Peace Corps, recognizing how critical it is to prevent, reduce, and control marine litter and plastics entering the Caribbean Sea. We want in particular to recognize and thank the governments of Jamaica and Panama, but also want to pledge our commitment that this is not just for two islands in the wider Caribbean region, but we plan to expand this effort throughout the region recognizing how critical, especially for small island developing states, economic development, tourism, fisheries, maritime transportation, we need to solve this problem and we've heard the excellent solutions that are available. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Jane and, and Chris. Let me now call on Dr. Holy Bamford, the Assistant Administrator of NOAA's National Ocean Service. Is it Holy or Holly? Holly. It's Holly. Oh, so. I'm sorry. You wish it was Holy. I wish it was Holy, and you know, I wish this was made out of plastic. You know, I can't. Well, next year around, you'll have a chance. Part. Exactly, exactly. So again, Holly Banford with the U.S. Government, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and as welcome everybody, and, and thank you for uh, today's wonderful panel. We heard some great things from the panel, and I think it's clear that we need partnerships, we need innovation and we need to address from a multi-pronged approach. Uh, NOAA and the U.S. government is going to continue to combat this severe and major problem in our oceans by doing three things. First is education, outreach, and enhancing social science. I really do believe it's changing people's behavior and really getting the right messages out to people, as well as looking at incentives for waste management reduction. Um, you know, we have a project called uh, Fishing for Energy, which, David, we can share. We use nets to actually convert energy. We have a lot of nets out there we can clearly share with you uh, to produce different products. Second is research. At looking at the economic impact, I truly believe, Mr. Mundy, we do have to look at the economic impact of marine debris, as well as the social impacts and ultimately in the environmental impacts. We're not going to be able to stop it tomorrow at the spigot, so we need to continue to understand the impacts to reduce those impacts of debris. And then third is really while we do those is we have to continue to remove debris from our most sensitive habitats. And to that end, through the U.S. government, NOAA is going to commit $1.5 million to remove marine debris from the most sensitive habitats in the United States in 2016, as well as contribute to local partners in advancing education, outreach, and social science to change behavior so we can stop it at the spigot. Thank you. Holly, that is a most holy endeavor. Thank you. So now let me call on Andreas Merkel, the uh, CEO of Ocean Conservancy. By the way, Ocean Conservancy just published this report, which is Stemming the Tide, Land-Based Strategies for a Plastic-Free Ocean, 
about 10 days ago or a week ago, you should take it with you. It's great reading. Required reading. Required reading. Thank you, Andreas. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for this chance. Um, yeah, we're Ocean Conservancy. We're tackling this problem from all kinds of angles. We have the citizen science, uh, over 600,000 volunteers that get out every year and do the international coastal cleanup. Uh, we sponsor a lot of the hard science of where is this plastic coming from, where is it going, what is it doing, and what kind of harm is it doing. And maybe the most important thing we do is we try to get to the root causes um, and solutions of all of this. And the root cause, as was laid out um, frequently today, is that incredible mismatch between an exploding consumption of plastic in the industrializing countries of this world and the very much lagging infrastructure behind it of actually managing that waste. Um, and uh, we heard today again that if you just, if we tackled that uh, in just the five most um, prolific countries in that way, we could probably cut about half of this problem out entirely tomorrow if we could do that. Now, how that is done, you know, what is, what is the root solution? It's the basic infrastructure, right? It's collecting it safely, it's transporting it safely, it's storing it safely, and eventually it's treating it. And it's the private sector that's going to eventually have to do that. Um, as, as Justin Mundy pointed out, this is a fundamental infrastructure project finance issue. But what we can do is help create the, in, the, the conditions in these countries that, that makes infrastructure investment in waste management an attractive proposition. And to that end, what we're pledging to do um, is to spend two and a half million dollars in the next two years in going into two or three of these critical regions and helping and working with industry, with the multilateral banks, with the municipalities, with the national governments, and trying to actually create an, invest, an investable, a bankable set of deals that unleashes the logjam there's no shortage of capital in Asia, right? Local capital, sovereign wealth funds, and so on and so forth, to, uh, to, uh, to break the logjam and unleash that, that, that kind of investment, taking away the barriers, lowering the cost of capital, managing the risk, and getting it done. This is going to require, um, you know, looking at the legal aspects, the project finance action, the regulatory pieces, finance pieces, and so on. We'll do that through the uh, Trash Free Sea Alliance, which already exists. Um, and puts together corporations, multilaterals, um, uh, nonprofits, um, and we need all your help um, to help us do it because that is the fundamental root cause to this. Thank you very kindly. Thank you so much, Andreas. Strategically important. So our last commitment of this afternoon, let me call on Mrs. Mariela Formas. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Chilean Plastic Industry Trade Association. Thank Adelante, you. Mariela. Gracias. I would love to do this announcement in English, however, I will do it in Spanish. Por favor. The Association of Plastic Industries in Chile believes that it must uh, take responsibility for its surroundings. And so, as the plastics industry, we would like to be a benchmark in this area. So, but during 2014 and 2015, we've done recycling programs in the private sector, but also with the community, creating agreements with municipalities, setting up plastic recycling networks so that preventively they may never get to the sea and may have a more sustainable destination. However, the most iconic plastics recycling program is the one for Rapa Nui. And in this program, together with the municipality of Rabanui, we have made a collection and selection of all plastics produced in Easter Island, and they've been brought to the continent for recycling. More than 15 tons of plastic, equivalent to more than 400,000 plastic bottles. And so we wish to extend this plastic recycling program for Rapanui, for macroplastics that today are collected by the Rapanui communities and by the people who work at the municipality of Rapanui. We're working and we have the samples and we are classifying these macroplastics so they too may be brought to the continent and recycled. Here we have a sample which has already been classified and these can be recycled also in Chile. Thank you. Thank you, Mariela. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, time if we overrun five minutes because uh, we started late five minutes. We have uh, time for one or two questions from the audience. A question is a short string of words with a question mark at the end. Uh, just for clarification purposes. Well, it seems that everything is clear. Then we are almost about to finish on time. I think we owe uh, a deep, deep gratitude to the United States under Secretary of State. Thank you so much for having wonderfully led this initiative last year. And we will thank your government through you. And we also owe a deep, deep degree of gratitude and respect to Chile, who I would like to thank in the name of an institution called CERNAPESCA, El Servicio Nacional de Pesca. Are there people here from CERNAPESCA in the audience? Are there? No. One. Please stand up, sir. Thank you so much. Well, CERNAPESCA is doing stellar pioneering work on something that was addressed this morning, which is IUU fishing, by putting in traceability as has never really been done any place around the world into effect. Thank you so much, Chile, through Serna Pesca for everything that you are doing, sir. Muchísimas gracias. Muy amable. A deep word of gratitude to the best panel ever. And to a wonderful audience. Thank you so much, y buenas tardes. <laughs>